Section 16 of Heart, a Schoolboy's Journal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin, Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Heart, a Schoolboy's Journal, by Edmondo Diamicis, translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. April Part Two, My Father's Teacher. Tuesday, eleventh. What a fine trip I took yesterday with my father! This is the way it came about. Day before yesterday at dinner, as my father was reading the newspaper, he suddenly gave an exclamation of surprise. Then he said, "And I thought him dead twenty years ago." Do you know that my old first elementary teacher, Vincenzo Corsetti, is eighty-four years old? I see here that the minister has conferred on him the Medal of Merit for sixty years of teaching. Sixty years, you understand, and it is only two years since he stopped teaching school. Poor Corsetti! He lives an hour's journey from here by rail, at Condove, in the country of our old gardener's wife, of the town of Chieri, and he added, Enrico, we will go to see him. He talked of nothing but him the whole evening. The name of his primary teacher recalled to his mind a thousand things which had happened when he was a boy, his early companions, his dead mother. Crosetti, he exclaimed, he was forty when I was with him. I seem to see him now. He was a small man, somewhat bent even then with bright eyes and always cleanly shaven severe but in a good way for he loved us like a father and forgave us more than one offence he had risen from a peasant by virtue of study and privations he was a fine man my mother was attached to him and my father treated him like a friend how comes it that he has gone to end his days at condove near turin he certainly will not know me. Never mind, I shall know him. Forty-four years have elapsed. Forty-four years, Enrico, and we will go to see him tomorrow. So yesterday morning, at nine o'clock, we were at the Susa railway station. I should have liked to have Garon come too, but he could not because his mother is ill. It was a beautiful spring day. The train ran through green fields and hedgerows in blossom, and the air we breathed was perfumed. My father was delighted, and every little while he would put his arm round my neck and talk to me like a friend, as he gazed out over the country. Poor Crosetti, he said. He was the first man, after my father, to love me and do me good. I have never forgotten certain of his good counsels and also certain sharp reprimands which caused me to go home with a lump in my throat. His hands were large and stubby. I can see him now, as he used to enter the schoolroom, place his cane in a corner and hang his coat on the peg, always with the same gesture. And every day he was in the same humor, always conscientious, full of good will and attentive, as though each day he were teaching school for the first time. I remember him as well as though I heard him now when he called to me, Bottini, eh, Bottini, the four and middle fingers on that pen. He must have changed greatly in these four and forty years. As soon as we reached Condove, we went in search of our old gardener's wife of Chieri, who keeps a stall in an alley. We found her with her boys. She made much of us and gave us news of her husband, who is soon to return from Greece, where he has been working these three years, and of her eldest daughter, who is in the deaf-mute institute in Turin. Then she pointed out to us the street which led to the teacher's house, for every one knows him. We left the town, and turned into a steep lane flanked by blossoming hedges. My father no longer talked, but appeared entirely lost in his reminiscences, and every now and then he smiled and shook his head. Suddenly he halted and said, Here he is. 
I will wager that this is he. Down the lane towards us, a little old man with a white beard and large hat came, leaning on a cane. He dragged his feet along, and his hands trembled. It is he, repeated my father, hastening his steps. When we were close to him, we stopped. The old man stopped also, and looked at my father. His face was still fresh-colored, and his eyes were clear and bright. "'Are you?' asked my father, raising his hat. "'Vincenzo Crosetti, the schoolmaster?' The old man raised his hat also, and replied, "'I am,' in a voice that was somewhat tremulous, but full. "'Well, then,' said my father, taking one of his hands, permit one of your old scholars to shake your hand and to inquire how you are i have come from turin to see you the old man stared at him in amazement then he said you do me much honour i do not know when were you my scholar excuse me your name if you please my father told his name alberto bottini and the year in which he had attended school and where and he added, It is natural that you should not remember me, but I recall you perfectly. The master bent his head and gazed at the ground in thought, and muttered my father's name three or four times. The latter, meanwhile, watched him with intent and smiling eyes. All at once the old man raised his face, with his eyes opened widely, and said slowly, Alberto Bontini? the son of Bottini, the engineer, the one who lived in the Piazza della Consolata. The same, replied my father, holding out his hands. Then, said the old man, permit me, my dear sir, permit me, and advancing, he embraced my father. His white head hardly reached the latter's shoulder. My father pressed his cheek to his brow. Have the goodness to come with me, said the teacher and without speaking any further he turned about and took the road to his dwelling. In a few minutes we arrived at a garden plot in front of a tiny house with two doors, round one of which there was a fragment of whitewashed wall. The teacher opened the second and ushered us into a room. There were four white walls. In one corner a cot bed with a blue and white checked coverlet. In another a small table with a little library four chairs, and an old map nailed to the wall. A pleasant odor of apples was noticeable. We seated ourselves, all three. My father and his teacher were silent for several minutes. Bottini, exclaimed the master at length, fixing his eyes on the brick floor where the sunlight formed a checkerboard. Oh, I remember well. Your mother was such a good woman. For a while, during your first year, you sat on a bench to the left near the window. Let us see whether I do not recall it. I can still see your curly head. Then he thought for a while longer. You are a lively lad, eh? Very. The second year you had an attack of croup. I remember when they brought you back to school, thin and wrapped up in a shawl. Forty years have gone by since then, have they not? You are very kind to remember your poor teacher. And do you know, others of my old pupils have come hither in years gone by to seek me out. There was a colonel, and there were some priests, and several gentlemen. He asked my father what his profession was. Then he said, I am glad, heartily glad, I thank you. It is quite a while now since I have seen any one. I very much fear that you will be the last, my dear sir. "'Don't say that!' exclaimed my father. "'You are well and still vigorous. You must not say that.' "'Eh, no,' replied the master. "'Do you see this trembling?' and he showed us his hands. "'This is a bad sign. It seized on me three years ago while I was still teaching school. At first I paid no attention to it. I thought it would pass off. But instead of that, it stayed and kept on increasing.' A day came when I could no longer write. Ah, that day on which I, for the first time, made a blot on the copy-book of one of my scholars was a stab in the heart for me, my dear sir. 
I did drag on for a while longer, but I was at the end of my strength. After sixty years of teaching, I was forced to bid farewell to my school, to my scholars, to work. And it was hard, you understand, hard. The last time that I gave a lesson, all the scholars accompanied me home, and made much of me, but I was sad. I understood that my life was finished. I had lost my wife the year before, and my only son. I had only two peasant grandchildren left. Now I am living on a pension of a few hundred lire. I no longer do anything. It seems to me as though the days would never come to an end. My only occupation, you see, is to turn over my old school books, my scholastic journals, and a few volumes that have been given to me. There they are, he said, indicating his little library. There are my memories, my whole past. I have nothing else left to me in the world. Then in a tone that was suddenly joyous, I want to give you a surprise, my dear Signor Bottini. He rose, and approaching his desk, he opened a long casket, holding numerous little parcels, all tied up with a slender cord, and each bearing a date in four figures. After a little search, he opened one, turned over several papers, drew forth a yellowed sheet, and handed it to my father. It was some of his schoolwork of forty years before. At the top was written, Alberto Bottini, Dictation, April 3, 1838. My father instantly recognized his own large schoolboy hand, and began to read it with a smile. But all at once his eyes grew moist. I rose and inquired the cause. He drew one arm around my body, and pressing me to his side, he said, Look at this sheet of paper. Do you see? These are the corrections made by my poor mother. She always strengthened my L's and my T's. And the last lines are entirely hers. She had learned to imitate my letters, and when I was tired and sleepy, she finished my work for me. My sainted mother! And he kissed the page. See here, said the teacher, showing him the other packages. These are my mementos. Each year I laid aside one piece of work of each of my pupils, and they are all here, dated and arranged in order. Every time that I open them thus, and read a line here and there, a thousand things recur to my mind, and I seem to be living once more in the days that are past. How many of them have passed, my dear sir? I close my eyes, and I see behind me face after face, class after class. Hundreds and hundreds of boys, and who knows how many of them are already dead. Many of them I remember well. I recall distinctly the best and the worst. Those who gave me the greatest pleasure, and those who caused me to pass sorrowful moments, for I have had serpents too among that vast number. But now, you understand, it is as though I were already in the other world, and I love them all equally." He sat down again, and took one of my hands in his. "'And tell me,' my father said with a smile, "'do you recall any of my roguish tricks?' "'Of yours, sir?' replied the old man, also with a smile. "'No, not just at this moment. But that does not in the least mean that you never played any. However, you had good judgment. You were serious for your age. I remember your mother's great love for you but it is very kind and courteous of you to have come to seek me out. How could you leave your business to come and see a poor old schoolmaster? Listen, Signor Crosetti, responded my father with vivacity, I recollect the first time that my poor mother accompanied me to school. It was to be her first parting from me for two hours, of letting me out of the house alone, in other hands than my father's, in the hands of a stranger, in short. To this good creature my entrance into school was like my entrance into the world, the first of a long series of necessary and painful separations. It was society which was tearing her son from her for the first time, never again to return him to her entirely. She was much affected. So was I. I bade her farewell with a trembling voice, and then, as she went away, I saluted her once more through the glass in the door, 
with my eyes full of tears. And just at that point you made a gesture with one hand, laying the other on your breast as though to say, Trust me, madame. Well, the gesture, the glance, from which I saw that you had understood all the feelings, all the thoughts of my mother, that look which seemed to say, Courage! That gesture, which was an honest promise of protection, of affection, of indulgence, I have never forgotten. It has remained forever engraved on my heart, and it is that memory which induced me to set out from Turin. And here I am, after the lapse of four and forty years, for the purpose of saying to you, I thank you, my dear teacher. The master did not reply. He stroked my hair with his hand, and his hand shook, and glided from my hair to my forehead, from my forehead to my shoulder. In the meantime, my father was noticing the bare walls, the wretched bed, the morsel of bread and the little vial of oil which lay on the window-sill, and he seemed desirous of saying, Poor master, after sixty years of teaching, is this all your reward? But the good old man was content, and began once more to talk gaily of our family, of the other teachers of that day, and of my father's schoolmates, some of them he remembered, and some of them he did not, and each told the other news of this one or of that one. When my father interrupted the conversation to beg the old man to come down into town and lunch with us, he replied effusively, I thank you, I thank you. But he seemed undecided. My father took him by both hands and insisted. But how should I manage to eat? said the master with these poor hands which shake in this way. It is a penance for others also. We will help you, master, said my father, and then he accepted, as he shook his head and smiled. This is a beautiful day, he said, as he closed the outer door. A beautiful day, dear Signor Bottini. I assure you that I shall remember it as long as I live. My father gave one arm to the master, and the latter took me by the hand, and we walked down the lane. We met two little barefooted girls leading some cows, and a boy who passed us on a run with a huge load of straw on his shoulders. The master told us that they were scholars of the second grade, that in the morning they led the cattle to pasture and worked in the fields barefoot, and in the afternoon they put on their shoes and went to school. It was nearly midday. We met no one else. In a few minutes we reached the inn, seated ourselves at a large table with the master between us, and began our lunch. The inn was silent as a convent. The teacher was very merry, and his excitement increased his palsy. He could hardly eat. But my father cut up his meat, broke his bread, and put salt on his plate. In order to drink, he was obliged to hold the glass with both hands and even then he struck his teeth. But he talked constantly, and with ardor, of the reading books of his young days, of schools of the present day, of the praises bestowed on him by his superiors, of the rules of late years, and all with that serene countenance, a trifle redder than at first, and with that gay voice of his, and that laugh, which was almost the laugh of a young man, and my father gazed and gazed at him, with that same expression with which I sometimes catch him looking at me, at home, when he is thinking and smiling to himself, with his face turned aside. The teacher let some wine trickle down on his breast. My father rose and wiped it off with his napkin. "'No, sir, I cannot permit this,' the old man said and smiled. He said some words in Latin, and finally he raised his glass, which wavered about in his hand, and said very gravely, To your health, my dear signor, to that of your children, to the memory of your good mother. To yours, my good master, replied my father, pressing his hand. And at the end of the room stood the innkeeper, and several others, watching us, and smiling as though they were pleased at this attention which was being shown to the teacher from their parts. At a little after two o'clock we came out, and the teacher wanted to escort us to the station, 
my father gave him his arm once more and he again took me by the hand i carried his cane for him the people paused to look on for they all knew him some saluted him at one point in the street we heard through an open window many boys voices reading together and spelling the old man halted and seemed to be saddened by it this my dear signor bottini he said is what pains me to hear the voices of boys in school and not to be there any more to think that another man is there i have heard that music for sixty years and i have grown to love it now i am deprived of my family i have no sons no master my father said to him starting on again you still have many sons scattered about the world who remember you as i have always remembered you no no replied the master sadly i no longer have a school i no longer have any sons and without sons i shall not live much longer my hour will soon strike do not say that master do not think it said my father you have done so much good in every way you have put your life to such a noble use the aged teacher bent his hoary head for an instant on my father's shoulder and pressed my hand we entered the station the train was on the point of starting farewell master said my father kissing him on both cheeks farewell thanks farewell replied the master taking one of my father's hands in his two trembling hands and pressing it to his heart then i kissed him and felt that his face was bathed in tears my father pushed me into the railway carriage and at the moment of starting he quickly removed the coarse cane from the schoolmaster's hand and in its place he put his own handsome one with a silver handle and his initials saying keep it in memory of me the old man tried to return it and to recover his own but my father was already inside and had closed the door farewell my kind master farewell my son responded the teacher as the train moved off and may god bless you for the consolation which you have afforded to a poor old man until we meet again cried my father in a voice full of emotion but the teacher shook his head, as much to say, we shall never see each other more. Yes, yes, repeated my father, until we meet again. And the other replied by raising his trembling hand to heaven, Up there! And thus he disappeared from our sight, with his hand on high. End of section 16《Section 17 of Heart, a Schoolboy's Journal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Heart, a Schoolboy's Journal by Edmondo de Amicis. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. April, Part 3. Convalescence. Thursday, 20th. Who could have told me, when I returned from that delightful trip with my father, that for ten days I should not see the country or the sky again? I have been very ill, in danger of my life. I have heard my mother sobbing. I have seen my father very, very pale, gazing intently at me, and my sister Sylvia and my brother talking in a low voice, and the doctor with his spectacles who was there every moment, and who said things to me that I did not understand. In truth— I have been on the verge of saying a final farewell to every one. Ah, my poor mother! I passed three or four days at least, of which I recollect almost nothing, as though I had been in a dark and perplexing dream. I thought I beheld at my bedside my kind schoolmistress of the upper primary, who was trying to stifle her cough in her handkerchief in order not to disturb me. In the same manner I confusedly recall my teacher, who bent over to kiss me, and who pricked my face a little with his beard and I saw, as in a mist, the red head of Crossi, the golden curls of De Rossi, the Calabrian clad all in black, all pass by, and Garone, who brought me a mandarin orange with its leaves, and ran away in haste because his mother is ill. Then I awoke, as from a very long dream, 
and understood that I was better from seeing my father and mother smiling, and hearing Sylvia singing softly. Oh, what a sad dream it was! Then I began to improve every day. The little mason came and made me laugh once more for the first time with his hare's face. And how well he does it, now that his face is somewhat lengthened through illness, poor fellow! And Coretti came, and Garoffi came to present me with two tickets in his new lottery of a penknife with five surprises, which he purchased of a second-hand dealer in the Via Bertola. Then yesterday, while I was asleep, Precossi came and laid his cheek on my hand without waking me, and as he came from his father's workshop, with his face covered with coal dust, he left a black print on my sleeve, the sight of which caused me great pleasure when I awoke. How green the trees have become in these few days, and how I envy the boys whom I see running to school with their books when my father carries me to the window. But I shall go back there soon myself. I am so impatient to see all the boys once more, and my seat, the garden, the streets, to know all that has taken place during the interval, to apply myself to my books again and to my copy-books, which I seem not to have seen for a year. How pale and thin my poor mother has grown! poor father how weary he looks and my kind companions who came to see me and walked on tiptoe and kissed my brow it makes me sad even now to think that one day we must part perhaps i shall continue my studies with zerasi and with some others but how about all the rest when the fourth grade is once finished then good-bye we shall never see each other again i shall never see them again at my bedside when i am ill garone precossi coretti who are such fine boys and kind and dear comrades never more friends among the working men thursday twentieth why never more enrico that will depend on yourself when you have finished the fourth grade you will go to the high school and they will become working men but you will remain in the same city for many years perhaps why then will you never meet again when you are in the university of the lyceum you will seek them out in their shops or their workrooms and it will be a great pleasure for you to meet the companions of your youth once more as men at work i should wonder to see you neglecting to look up coretti or precossi wherever they may be and you will go to them and you will pass hours in their company and you will see when you come to study life and the world how many things you can learn from them which no one else is capable of teaching you both about their arts and their society and your own country and have a care for if you do not preserve these friendships it will be extremely difficult for you to acquire other similar ones in the future friendships i mean to say outside of the class to which you belong and thus you will live in one class only and the man who associates with but one social class is like the student who reads but one book let it be your firm resolve then from this day forth that you will keep these good friends even after you shall be separated and from this time forth cultivate precisely these by preference because they are the sons of working men you see men of the upper classes are the officers and men of the lower classes are the soldiers of toil and thus in society as in the army not only is the soldier no less noble than the officer since nobility consists in work and not in wages in valour and not in rank but if there is also a superiority of merit it is on the side of the soldier of the workmen who draw the lesser profit from the work therefore love and respect above all others among your companions the sons of the soldiers of labor honor in them the toil and the sacrifices of their parents disregard the differences of fortune and of class upon which the base alone regulate their sentiments and courtesy reflect that from the veins of laborers in the shops and in the country issued nearly all that blessed blood which has redeemed your country love garone love coretti love precossi love your little mason who in their little working men's breasts possess the hearts of princes and take an oath to yourself that no change of fortune shall ever wipe out these friendships of childhood from your soul swear to yourself that forty years hence if while passing through a railway station you recognize your old garone in the garments of an engineer with a black face ah i cannot think what to tell you to swear i am sure that you will jump upon the engine and fling your arms round his neck though you were even a senator of the kingdom your father garone's mother saturday twenty ninth on my return to school the first thing i heard was some bad news garone had not been there for several days because his mother was seriously ill she died on saturday yesterday morning as soon as we came into school the teacher said to us the greatest misfortune that can happen to a boy 
has happened to poor Garone. His mother is dead. He will return to school tomorrow. I beseech you, boys, respect the terrible sorrow that is now rending his soul. When he enters, greet him with affection and gravely. Let no one jest, let no one laugh at him, I beg of you. And this morning, poor Garone came in, a little later than the rest. I felt a blow at my heart at the sight of him. His face was haggard, his eyes were red, and he was unsteady on his feet. It seemed as though he had been ill for a month. I hardly recognized him. He was dressed all in black. He aroused our pity. No one even breathed. All gazed at him. No sooner had he entered than at the first sight of that schoolroom, whither his mother had come to get him nearly every day, of that bench over which she had bent on so many examination days to give him a last bit of advice, and where he had so many times thought of her, in his impatience to run out and meet her, he burst into a desperate fit of weeping. The teacher drew him aside to his own place and pressed him to his breast, and said to him, "'Weep, weep, my poor boy, but take courage. Your mother is no longer here, but she sees you. She still loves you. She still lives by your side, and one day you will behold her once again, for you have a good and noble soul like her own. Take courage.' Having said this, he accompanied him to the bench near me. I dared not look at him. He drew out his copy-books and his books, which he had not opened for many days, and as he opened the reading-book at a place where there was a cut representing a mother leading her son by the hand, he burst out crying again, and laid his head on his arm. Their master made us a sign to leave him thus, and began the lesson. I should have liked to say something to him, but I did not know what. I laid one hand on his arm and whispered in his ear, "'Don't cry, Garone.' He made no reply, and without raising his head from the bench, he laid his hand on mine and kept it there a while. At the close of school no one spoke to him. All hovered round him respectfully and in silence. I saw my mother waiting for me and ran to embrace her, but she held me back and gazed at Garone. For the moment I could not understand why, but then I saw that Garone was standing apart by himself and looking at me, and he had a look of indescribable sadness which seemed to say, "'You are embracing your mother, and I shall never embrace mine again. You still have a mother, and mine is dead.' And then I knew why my mother had thrust me back, and I went out without taking her hand. Giuseppe Mazzini, Saturday, 29th this morning also Garone came to school with a pale face and his eyes swollen with weeping, and he hardly cast a glance at the little gifts which we had placed on his desk to console him. But the teacher had brought a page from a book to read to him in order to encourage him. He first informed us that we are to go to-morrow at one o'clock to the town hall to witness the award of the medal for civic valour to a boy who has saved a little child from the Poe and that on Monday he will dictate the description of the festival to us instead of the monthly story. Then, turning to Garone, who was standing with drooping head, he said to him, Make an effort, Garone, and write down what I dictate to you as well as the rest. We all took our pens, and the teacher dictated. Giuseppe Mazzini was born in Genoa in 1805 and died in Pisa in 1872, a grand, patriotic soul, the mind of a great writer, the first inspirer and apostle of the Italian Revolution, who, out of love for his country, lived for forty years poor, exiled, persecuted, a fugitive heroically steadfast in his principles and in his resolutions. Giuseppe Mazzini, who adored his mother, and who derived from her all that there was noblest and purest in her strong and gentle soul, wrote as follows to a faithful friend of his to console him in the greatest of misfortunes. These are almost his exact words. My friend, you will never more behold your mother on this earth. That is the terrible truth. I do not attempt to see you, because yours is one of those solemn and sacred sorrows which each must suffer and conquer for himself. Do you understand what I mean to convey by the words, one must conquer sorrow? Conquer the least sacred, the least purifying part of sorrow, that which, instead of rendering the soul better, weakens and debases it. But the other part of sorrow, the noble part, that which enlarges and elevates the soul, that must remain and never leave you more. Nothing here below can take the place of a good mother. In griefs, in the consolations which life may still bring you, you will never forget her, but you must recall her, 
love her, mourn her death, in a manner which is worthy of her. Oh, my friend, hearken to me, death exists not, it is nothing. It cannot even be understood. Life is life, and it follows the law of life, progress. Yesterday you had a mother on earth, today you have an angel elsewhere. All that is good will survive the life of the earth with increased power. Hence also the love of your mother. She loves you now more than ever, and you are responsible for your actions to her more even than before. It depends upon you, upon your actions, to meet her once more, to see her in another existence. You must therefore, out of love and reverence for your mother, grow better, and cause her to joy for you. Henceforth you must say at every act, Would my mother approve this? Her transformation has placed a guardian angel in the world for you, to whom you must refer in all your affairs, in everything that pertains to you. Be strong and brave. Fight against desperate and vulgar grief. Have the tranquillity of great suffering in great souls, and that is what she would have. Garone, added the teacher, be strong and tranquil, for that is what she would have. Do you understand? Garone nodded assent, while great and fast-flowing tears streamed over his hands, his copy-book, and his desk. Civic Valor, Monthly Story at one o'clock we went with our schoolmaster to the front of the town hall to see the medal for civic valor bestowed on the lad who had saved one of his comrades from the Po. On the front terrace waved a huge tri-colored flag. We entered the courtyard of the palace. It was already full of people. At the further end of it was visible a table with a red cover and papers on it, and behind it a row of gilded chairs for the mayor and the council. The ushers of the municipality were there, with their under-waistcoats of sky-blue and their white stockings. To the right of the courtyard a detachment of policemen, who had a great many medals, was drawn up in a line, and beside them a detachment of custom-house officers. On the other side were the firemen in festive array, and numerous soldiers, not in line, who had come to look on, cavalrymen, sharpshooters, artillerymen. Then all around were gentlemen, country people, and some officers and women and boys who had assembled. We crowded into a corner where many scholars from other buildings were already collected with their teachers. Near us was a group of boys between ten and eighteen years of age, belonging to the common people, who were talking and laughing loudly, and we made out that they were all from Borgo Po, comrades or acquaintances of the boy who was to receive the medal. Above, all the windows were thronged with the employees of the city government. The balcony of the library was also filled with people who pressed against the balustrade, and in the one on the opposite side, which is over the entrance gate, stood a crowd of girls from the public schools, and many daughters of soldiers with their pretty blue veils. It looked like a theatre. All were talking merrily, glancing every now and then at the red table, to see whether any one had made his appearance. A band of music was playing softly at the end of the portico. The sun beat down on the lofty walls. It was beautiful. All at once, everyone began to clap their hands from the courtyard, from the balconies, from the windows. I raised myself on tiptoe to look. The crowd which stood behind the red table had parted, and a man and a woman had come forward. The man was leading a boy by the hand. This was the lad who had saved his comrade. The man was his father, a mason, dressed in his best. The woman, his mother, small and blonde, had on a black gown. The boy, also small and blonde, had on a grey jacket. At the sight of all those people, and at the sound of that thunder of applause, all three stood still, not daring to look or move. A municipal usher pushed them along to the side of the table on the right. All remained quiet for a moment, and then, once more, the applause broke out on all sides. The boy glanced up at the windows, and then at the balcony with the daughters of soldiers. He held his cap in his hand, and he did not seem to understand very thoroughly where he was. It struck me that he looked a little like Coretti in the face, but he was redder. His father and mother kept their eyes fixed on the table. In the meantime all the boys from Borgo Po who were near us were making motions to their comrade, to attract his attention, and hailing him in a low tone. Pin! Pin! Peanut! At last they made themselves heard. The boy glanced at them and hid his smile behind his cap. At a certain moment the guards drew themselves up to attention. The mayor entered, accompanied by numerous gentlemen. The mayor, all white with a big tri-coloured scarf, 
placed himself beside the table, standing. All the others took their places behind and beside him. The band ceased playing, the mayor made a sign, and everyone grew quiet. He began to speak. I did not understand the first words perfectly, but I gathered he was telling the story of the boy's feet. Then he raised his voice, and it rang out so clear and sonorous through the whole court that I did not lose another word. When he saw from the shore his comrades struggling in the river, already overcome with fear of death, he tore the clothes from his back and hastened to his assistance without hesitating an instant. They shouted to him, You will be drowned. He made no reply. They caught hold of him. He freed himself. They called him by name. He was already in the water. The river was swollen, the risk terrible even for a man. But he flung himself to meet death with all the strength of his little body and his great heart. He reached the unfortunate fellow and seized him just in time, when he was already under water, and dragged him to the surface. He fought furiously with the waves which strove to overwhelm him, with his companion who tried to cling to him, and several times he disappeared beneath the water and rose again with a desperate effort. Obstinate, invincible in his purpose, not like a boy who was trying to save another boy, but like a man, like a father who is struggling to save his son, who is his hope and his life. In short, God did not permit so generous a prowess to be displayed in vain. The child swimmer tore the victim from the gigantic river and brought him to land, and with the assistance of others rendered him his first succor, after which he returned home quietly and alone, and ingenuously narrated his deed. Gentlemen, beautiful and worthy of veneration is heroism in a man. But in a child, in whom there can be no prompting of ambition or of profit whatever, in a child who must have all the more ardor in proportion as he has less strength, in a child from whom we require nothing, who is bound to nothing, who already appears to us so noble and lovable, not when he acts but when he merely understands, and is grateful for the sacrifices of others, in a child heroism is divine. I will say nothing more, gentlemen, I do not care to deck with superfluous praises such simple grandeur. Here before you stands the noble and valorous rescuer. Soldiers, greet him as a brother. Mothers, bless him like a son. Children, remember his name, engrave on your minds his visage, that it may never more be erased from your memories and from your hearts. Approach, my boy. In the name of the King of Italy I give you the medal for civic valor. An extremely loud hurrah, uttered at the same moment by many voices, made the palace ring. The mayor took the medal from the table and fastened it on the boy's breast. Then he embraced and kissed him. The mother placed one hand over her eyes. The father held his chin on his breast. The mayor shook hands with both, and taking the decree of decoration, which was bound with a ribbon, he handed it to the woman. Then he turned to the boy again and said, May the memory of this day, which is such a glorious one for you, such a happy one for your father and mother, keep you all your life in the path of virtue and honor. Farewell. The mayor withdrew, the band struck up, and everything seemed to be at an end, when the detachment of firemen opened, and the lad of eight or nine years, pushed forwards by a woman, who instantly concealed herself, rushed towards the boy with the decoration and flung himself in his arms. Another outburst of hurrahs and applause made the courtyard echo. Everyone had instantly understood that this was the boy who had been saved from the Po, and who had come to thank his rescuer. After kissing him, he clung to one arm, in order to accompany him out. These two, with the father and mother following behind, took their way towards the door, making a path with difficulty among the people who formed in line to let them pass. Policemen, boys, soldiers, women, all mingled together in confusion. All pressed forwards and raised on tiptoe to see the boy. Those who stood near him as he passed touched his hand. When he passed before the schoolboys, they all waved their caps in the air. Those from Borgo Po made a great uproar, pulling him by the arms and by his jacket and shouting, Pin! Hurrah for Pin! Bravo, Pinot! I saw him as he passed very close to me. His face was all aflame and happy. His medal had a red, white, and green ribbon. His mother was crying and smiling, his father was twirling his moustache with one hand, which quivered violently as though he had a fever. And from the windows and the balconies the people continued to lean out and applaud. 
all at once, when they were on the point of entering the portico, there fell from the balcony of the daughters of soldiers a veritable shower of pansies, of bunches of violets and daisies, which dropped upon the head of the boy, and of his father and mother, and scattered over the ground. Many people stooped to pick them up and hand them to the mother, and the band at the further end of the courtyard played very, very softly, a most entrancing air, which seemed like a song by a great many silvery voices, fading slowly into the distance on the banks of a river. End of section 17section eighteen of heart a schoolboy's journal this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kristen lewis houston texas heart a schoolboy's journal by edmondo diamichus translated by isabel florence hapgood may children with the rickets friday the fifth today i took a vacation because i was not well and my mother took me to the institute for children with the ricketts whither she went to recommend a child belonging to our porter but she did not allow me to go into the school did you not understand enrico why i did not permit you to enter it was an order not to place before the eyes of those unfortunate there in the midst of the school as though on exposition a strong healthy boy they have already but too many opportunities for making painful comparisons what a sad thing tears rushed from my heart when i went in there were sixty of them boys and girls poor tortured bones poor hands poor little shrivelled and distorted feet poor little deformed bodies i found many charming faces with eyes full of intelligence and affection there was one little child's face with a pointed nose and a sharp chin of an old woman but it wore a smile of celestial sweetness some viewed from the front are handsome and appear to be without defects but when they turn round they cast a weight upon your soul the doctor was there visiting them he set them upright on their benches and pulled up their little garments to fill their swollen stomachs and enlarged joints but they did not show the least shame poor creatures it was evident that they were children who were used to being undressed examined turned round on all sides and to think that they are now in the best stages of their malady when they hardly suffer at all while any more but who can say what they suffered during the first stage while their bodies were undergoing the process of deformation when with the increase of their infirmity they saw affection decrease around them poor children saw themselves left alone for hour after hour in a corner of the room or the courtyard badly nourished and at times scoffed at or tormented for months by bandages and by useless orthopedic apparatus now however thanks to care and good food and gymnastic exercise many are improving their schoolmistress makes them practice gymnastics it was a pitiful sight to see them at a certain command extend all those bandaged legs under the benches squeezed as they were between splints knotty and deformed limbs which should have been covered with kisses some could not rise from the bench but remained there with their heads resting on their arms stroking their crutches with their hands others on making the thrust with their arms felt their breasts fell them and fell back on their seats pale but smiling to conceal their panning. Ah, Enrico, you, other children, do not prize your good health, and it seems to you so small a thing to be well. I thought of the strong and thriving lads, whom their mothers carry about in triumph, proud of their beauty. I could have clasped all those poor little heads. I could have pressed them to my heart in despair. I could have said, had I been alone, I will never stir from here again. I wish to consecrate my life to you, to serve you, to be a mother to you all, to my last day. And in the meantime they sang, sang in peculiar, thin, sweet, sad voices, which penetrated the soul. When their teacher praised them, they looked happy, and as she passed among the benches, they kissed her hands and wrists, 
for they are very grateful for what is done for them and very affectionate these little angels have good minds and study well the teacher told me the teacher is young and gentle with a face full of kindness but with a certain expression of sadness like a reflection of the misfortunes which she caresses and comforts dear girl among all the human creatures who earn their livelihood by frail there is not one who earns it more holier than you your mother sacrifice tuesday ninth my mother is good and my sister sylvia is like her and has a large and noble heart yesterday evening i was copying a part of the monthly story from the apennies to the andes which the teacher has given out to us all in small portions to copy because it is so long when sylvia entered on tiptoe and said to me hastily and in a low voice come to mamma with me i heard her and papa talking together this morning some affair has gone wrong with papa and he was sad mamma was encouraging him we are in difficulties do you understand we have no more money papa said that it would be necessary to make sacrifices in order to recover himself now we must make sacrifices too must we not are you ready to do it well i will speak to mamma and do you agree and promise her on your honour that you will do everything that i shall say so saying she took me by the hand and led me to our mother who was sewing lost in thought i sat down on one end of the sofa sylvia on the other and she immediately began listen mamma i have something to say to you both of us have something to say to you mamma stared at us in surprise and sylvia began papa has no money has he what do you mean replied mamma turning crimson has he not indeed what do you know about it who has told you i know it said sylvia resolutely well then listen mamma we must make some sacrifices too you promised me a fan at the end of may and enrico was expecting his box of paints we don't want anything now we don't want to waste a soldo we shall be just as well pleased you know mamma tried to speak but sylvia said no it must be this way we have decided and until papa has money again we don't want any fruit or anything else broth will be enough for us and we will eat bread in the morning for breakfast so we shall spend less on the table for we already spend too much and we promise you that you will always find us perfectly contented is it not so enrico i replied that it was always as contented repeated sylvia closing mamma's mouth with one hand and if there are any other sacrifices to be made either in the manner of clothing or anything else we will make them gladly we would even sell our presents i would give up all my things and serve you as your maid we will not have anything done out of the house any more i will work all day long with you i will do everything you wish i am ready for anything for anything she exclaimed throwing her arms around my mother's neck if papa and mamma can only be saved for their troubles if i can only see you both once more at ease and in good spirits as in former days between your sylvia and your enrico who love you so dearly who would give their lives for you ah i have never seen my mother so happy as she was on hearing these words she never before kissed us on the brow in that way weeping and laughing and unable to speak then she assured sylvia that she had not understood rightly that we were not in the least reduced circumstances as she imagined and she thanked us a hundred times and was cheerful all the evening until my father came in when she told him all about it he did not open his mouth poor father but this morning as we sat at the table i felt at once both a great pleasure and a great sadness under my napkin i found my box of colors and under hers sylvia found her fan the fire thursday ninth this morning i had finished copying my share of the story from the apennies to the andres and was seeking for a theme for the original composition which the teacher had assigned us to write when i heard an unusual talking on the stairs 
and shortly after two firemen entered the house and asked permission of my father to inspect the stoves and chimneys because the chimney was on fire on the roof and they could not tell to whom it belonged my father said tray do so and although we had no fire burning anywhere they began to make the round of our apartments and to lay their ears to the walls to hear if the fires were roaring in the flues which ran up to the other floors of the house while they were going through the rooms my father said to me here is the theme for your composition enrico the fireman try to write down what i am about to tell you i saw them at work two years ago one evening when i was coming out of the balbo theatre late at night on entering the via roma i saw an unusual light and a crowd of people collecting a house was on fire tongues of flame and clouds of smoke were bursting from the windows and the roof men and women appeared at the windows and then disappeared uttering shrieks of despair there was a dense throng in front of the door the crowd was shouting they will be burned alive help the firemen at that moment a carriage arrived four firemen sprang out of it the first who had reached the town hall and rushed into the house they had already gone in when a horrible thing happened a woman ran to a window of the third story with a scream clenched the balcony climbed down it and remained thus clinging almost suspended in space with her back outwards bending beneath the flames which flashed out from the room and almost licked her hand the crowd uttered a cry of horror the firemen who had been stopped on the second floor by mistake by the terrified lodgers had already broken through a wall and into a room when a hundred shouts gave them warning on the third floor on the third floor they flew to the third floor there they found an infernal uproar beams from the roof crashing in corridors filled with a suffocating smoke in order to reach the rooms where the lodgers were imprisoned there was no other way left but to pass over the roof they instantly sprang upon it and a moment later something which resembled a black phantom appeared on the tiles in the midst of the smoke it was the corporal of the firemen who had been the first to arrive but in order to get from the roof to the small set of rooms cut off by the fire he was forced to pass over an extremely narrow space between a dormer window and the eaves trowel all the rest was in flames and that tiny space was covered with snow and ice and there was no place to hold on tis is impossible for him to pass shouted the crowd below the corporal advanced along the edge of the roof all shuddered and began to observe him with bated breath he passed a tremendous hurray rose toward the heavens the corporal resumed his way and on arriving at the point which was threatened he be began to break away with furious blows of his axe beams tiles and rafters in order to open a hole through which to descend unto the house meanwhile the woman was hanging outside the window the fire raged with increased violence over her head another moment and she would have fallen into the street the hole was opened we saw the corporal pull off his shoulder belt and lower himself inside the other firemen who had arrived followed at that instant a very lofty porta ladder which had just arrived was placed against the house in front of the windows whence issued flames in manacle house but it seemed as though they were too late no one can be saved now they shouted the firemen are burning the end has come they are dead all at once the black form of a corporal came in sight of the window with the balcony lighted up by the flames overhead the woman clasped him around the neck he caught her with both arms drew her up and laid her down inside the room the crowd set up a shout a thousand voices strong which rose above the roar of the conflagration but the others and how were they to get down the ladder which leaned against the roof on the front of the another window was at a good distance from them how could they get a hold of it while the people were saying this to themselves one of the firemen stepped out of the window set his right foot on the window sill and his left on the ladder standing thus upright in the air he grasped the lodgers one after the other as the other men handed them to him from within passed them on to the comrade who had climbed up from the street and who after securing a firm grasp for them on the rungs sent them down one after the other with the assistance of more firemen 
first came the woman who had clung to the balcony then a baby then another woman then an old man all were saved after the old man the fireman who had remained inside descended the last to come down was the corporal who had been the first to hasten up the crowd received them all with a burst of applause but when the last made his appearance the vanguard of the rescuers the one who had faced the abyss in advance of the rest the one who would have perished had it been fated that one should perish the crowd saluted him like a conqueror shouting and stretching out their arms with an affectionate impulse of admiration and of gratitude and in a few minutes his obscured name giuseppe robino rang from a thousand throats have you understood that is courage the courage of the heart which does not reason which does not waver which dashes blindly on like a lightning flash wherever it hears the cry of a dying man one of these days i will take you to the exercises of the firemen and i will point out to you corporal robino for you would be very glad to know him would you not i replied that i should here he is said my father i turned round with a start the two firemen having completed their inspection were crossing the room to the door my father pointed to a smaller of the men who had straps of gold braid and said shake hands with corporal robino the corporal stopped smiled and offered me his hand i shook it he made a salute and withdrew do not forget it said my father for out of the thousands of hands which you will shake in the course of your life there will probably not be ten which possess the worth of his end of section eighteen recording by kristen lewis houston texas section nineteen of heart a schoolboy's journal this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kristen lewis houston texas heart a schoolboy's journal by edmondo diamichis translated by isabel florence hapgood may from the Apennines to the Andes, the monthly story. Many years ago, a Guianese lad of thirteen, the son of a working man, went from Giona to America all alone to seek his mother. She had gone two years before to Buenos Aires, a city, the capital of Argentine Republic, to take service in a wealthy family, in order to earn in a short time enough to place her family once more in easy circumstances they having fallen through various misfortunes into poverty and debt they are courageous women not a few who take this long voyage with this object in view and who thanks to the large wages which people in service receive there return home at the end of a few years with several thousand lire the poor mother had wept bitterly at parting from her children the one aged eighteen the other eleven but she had set out full of courage and hope the voyage was pleasant and she had no sooner arrived at buenos aires than she found through a guionese shopkeeper a cousin of her husband who had been established there for a very long time a good argentine family which gave high wages and treated her well for a short time she kept up a regular correspondence with her family as it had been settled between them her husband addressed his letters to his cousins who forwarded them to the woman and the latter handed her replies to him and he dispatched them to gianoa adding a few lines of his own as she was earning eighty lire a month and spending nothing for herself she sent home a handsome sum every three months with which her husband who was a man of honour gradually paid off their most urgent debts and thus regained his good reputation in the meantime he worked away and was satisfied with the state of his affairs since he also cherished the hope that his wife would shortly return for the house seemed empty without her and the younger son in particular who was extremely attached to his mother was very much depressed and could not be reconciled to having her so far away but a year had elapsed since they had departed after a brief letter in which she said that her health was not very good 
they heard nothing more they wrote twice to the cousin the cousin did not reply they wrote to the argentini family where the woman was at service but it is possible that the letter never reached them for they had misspelled the name in addressing it they received no answer fearing some misfortune they wrote to the italian consulate at buenos aires to have inquiries made and after a lapse of three months they received a response from the consul to the effect that in spite of the advertisements in the newspapers no one had presented herself or sent any word and it could not have happened otherwise for this reason if for no other that with the idea of sparing the good name of her family which she fancied she was discrediting by becoming a servant the good woman had not given her real name to the argentine family several months more passed by with no news the father and sons were in consternation the youngest was oppressed by a melancholy which he could not conquer what was to be done to whom should they have recourse the father's first thought had been to set out to go to america in search of his wife but his work who would support his sons and neither could the eldest son go for he had just then begun to earn something and he was necessary to the family in this anxiety they lived repeating each day the same sad speeches are gazing at each other in silence when one evening marco the youngest declared with decision i am going to america to look for my mother his father shook his head sorrowfully and made no reply it was an affectionate thought but an impossible thing to make a journey to america which required a month alone at the age of thirteen but the boy patiently insisted he persisted that day the day after every day with great calmness reasoning with the good sense of a man others have gone there he said and smaller boys than i too once on board the ship i shall get there like any one else once arrived there i will only have to hunt up my cousin's shop there are plenty of italians there who will show me the street after finding our cousin my mother is found and if i do not find him i shall go to the consul i shall search out that argentine family whatever happens there is work for all there i shall find work also sufficient at least to earn enough to get home and thus little by little he almost succeeded in persuading his father his father esteemed him he knew that he had good judgment and courage that he was in earn to privations and sacrifices and that all these good qualities had acquired double force in his heart in consequence of the sacred project of finding his mother whom he adored in addition to this the captain of a steamer the friend of an acquaintance of his having heard the plan mentioned undertook to procure a free third-class passage for the argentine republic finally after a little hesitation the father gave his consent the voyage was decided on they filled a sack with clothes for him put a few crowns in his pocket and gave him the address of the cousin and one fine evening in april they saw him on board marco my son his father said to him as he gave him his last kiss with tears in his eyes on the plank of the steamer which was on the point of starting take courage you have set out on a holy undertaking and god will aid you poor marco his heart was strong and prepared for the hardest trials of this voyage but when he beheld his beautiful genoa disappear on the horizon and found himself on the open sea on that huge steamer thronged with emigrating peasants alone unacquainted with any one with that little bag which held his entire fortune a sudden discouragement assailed him for two days he remained crouching like a dog on the bows hardly eating and oppressed with the great desire to weep every kind of sad thought passed through his mind and the saddest the most terrible was the one which was the most persistent in its return the thought that his mother was dead in his broken and painful slumbers he constantly beheld a strange face which surveyed him with an air of compassion and whispered in his ear your mother is dead and then he awoke stifling a shriek nevertheless after passing the straits of gibraltar at the first sight of the atlantic ocean he recovered his spirits a little and his hope but it was only a brief respite that vast but always smooth sea the increasing heat 
the misery of all those poor people who surrounded him the consciousness of his own loneliness overwhelmed him once more the empty and monotonous days which succeeded each other became confounded in his memory as is the case with sick people it seemed to him that he had been at sea a year and every morning on waking he felt surprised at finding himself there alone on that vast watery expanse on his way to america the beautiful flying fish which fell on deck every now and then the marvellous sunsets of the tropics with their enormous clouds coloured like flame and blood all these nocturnal phosphorescence which made the ocean seem all on fire like a sea of lava did not produce on him the effect of real things but of marvels beheld in a dream there were days of bad weather during which he remained constantly in the cabin where everything was rolling and crashing in the midst of a terrible chorus of cries and curses and he thought that his last hour had come there were other days when the sea was calm and yellowish of insupportable heat of infinite tedious interminable and wretched hours during which the enervated passengers stretched motionless on the planks seemed all dead and the voyage was endless sea and sky sky and sea to-day the same as yesterday to-morrow like to-day and so on always eternally and for long hours he stood leaning on the bulwarks gazing at that boundless sea in wonder thinking vaguely of his mother until his eyes closed and his head was drooping with sleep and then again he beheld that unknown face which gazed upon him with an air of sympathy and repeated in his ear your mother is dead and at the sound of that voice he awoke with a start to resume his dreaming with wide open eyes and to gaze at the unchanging horizon the voyage lasted twenty-seven days but the last days were the best the weather was fine and the air was cool he had made the acquaintance of a good old man a lombard who was going to america to find his son an agriculturist in the vicinity of the town of rosario he had told him his whole story and the old man kept repeating every little while as he tapped him on the nape of the neck with his hand courage my lad you will find your mother well and happy this companionship comforted him his sad presentiments were turned into joyous ones seated on the bough beside the aged peasant who was smoking his pipe beneath the beautiful starry heavens in the midst of a group of singing peasants he imagined to himself in his own mind a hundred times his arrival at buenos aires he saw himself in a certain street he found the shop he flew to his cousin how is my mother come let us go at once let us go at once they hurried on together they ascended a staircase a door opened and here his mute sologai came to an end his imagination was swallowed up in a feeling of an inexpressible tenderness which made him secretly pull forth the little medal that he wore on his neck and murmur his prayers as he kissed it on the twenty-seventh day after their departure they arrived it was a beautiful rosy may morning when the steamer cast anchor in the immense river of the plata near the shore along which stretches the vast city of buenos aires the capital of the argentine republic this splendid weather seemed to him to be a good omen he was beside himself with joy and impatience his mother was only a few miles from him in a few hours more he would have seen her he was in america in the new world and he had had the daring to come alone the whole of that extremely long voyage now seemed to him to have passed in an instant it seemed to him that he had flown hither in a dream and that he had that moment waked and he was so happy that he hardly experienced any surprise or distress when he felt in his pockets and found only one of the two little heaps into which he had divided his little treasure in order to be the more sure of not losing the whole of it he had been robbed he had only a few liars left but what mattered that to him when he was near his mother with his bag in his hand he descended in company with many other italians to the tug-boat which carried him within a short distance of the shore clambered down from the tug in a boat which bore the name of andrea doria was landed on the wharf saluted his old lombard friend and directed his course in long strides toward the city on arriving at the entrance of the first street 
he stopped a man who was passing by and begged him to show him in what direction he should go in order to reach the streets of los artes he chanced to have stopped an italian workingman the latter surveyed him with curiosity and inquired if he knew how to read the lad nodded yes well then said the laborer pointing to the street from which he had just emerged keep straight on through there reading the names of all the streets on the corners you will end by finding the one you want the boy thanked him and turned into the street which opened before him it was a straight and endless but narrow street bordered by low white houses which looked like so many little villas filled with people with carriages with carts which made deafening noise here and there floated enormous banners of various hues with announcements as to the departure of streamers for strange cities inscribed upon them in large letters at every little distance along the street on the right and left he perceived two other streets which ran straight away as far as he could see also bordered by low white houses filled with people and vehicles and bounded at their extremities by the level lines of the measureless plains of america like the horizon at sea the city appeared infinite to him it seemed to him that he might wander for days or weeks seeing other streets like these on one hand and on the other and that all america must be covered with them he looked attentively at the names of the streets strange names which cost him an effort to read at every fresh street he felt his heart beat at the thought that it might be the one he was in search of he stared at all the women with the thought that he might meet his mother he caught sight of one in front of him who made his blood leap he overtook her she was a negro and quickening his pace he walked on and on on arriving at one cross street he read and stood as though rooted to the sidewalk it was the street of los artes he turned into it and saw the number one one seven his cousin's shop was number one seven five he quickened his pace still more and almost ran at number one seven one he had to pause to regain his breath and he said to himself oh my mother my mother is it really true that i shall see you in another moment he ran on he arrived at a little haberdasher's shop this was it he stepped up close to it he saw a woman with gray hair and spectacles what do you want boy she asked him in spanish is not this said the boy making an effort to utter a sound the shop of francisco morale francisco morale is dead replied the woman in italian the boy felt as though he had received a blow on his breast when did he die eh quite a while ago replied the woman months ago his affairs were in a bad state and he ran away they say he went to bahia blanca very far from here and he died just after he reached there the shop is mine the boy turned pale then he said quickly morelli knew my mother my mother who was at service with signor mequinas he alone could tell me where she is I have come to America to find my mother. Morelli sent her our letters. I must find my mother. Poor boy, said the woman. I don't know. I can ask the boy in the courtyard. He knew the young man who did Morelli's errands. He may be able to tell us something. She went to the end of the shop and called the lad who came at once. Tell me, asked the shopwoman, do you remember whether Morelli's young man went occasionally to carry letters to a woman in service in the house of a countryman? to signor mcquinnis replied the lad yes signor sometimes he did at the end of the street of los artes ah thanks signor cried marco tell me the number don't you know it send some one with me come with me without delay i have a few soldi left he said this with as much warmth that without waiting for the woman to request him the boy replied come and at once set out at a rapid pace they went almost at a run without saying a word to the end of the extremely long street made their way into the entrance of a little white house and halted in front of a handsome iron gate through which they could see a small yard filled with a vase of flowers marco gave a tug at the bell a young woman made her appearance the quintus family live here do they not asked the lad anxiously they did live here replied the young woman pronouncing her italian and spanish fashion now we the zabalos live here and where have the sequinus family gone asked marco his heart throbbing 
they have gone to cordoba cordoba exclaimed marco where is cordoba and the person whom they had in their service the woman my mother their servant was my mother had they taken my mother away too the young lady looked at him and said i do not know perhaps my father may know for he knew them when they went away wait a moment she ran away and soon returned with her father a tall gentleman with a gray beard he looked intently for a minute at this appealing type of a little Gionese sailor with his golden hair and his aquiline nose and asked him in broken italian is your mother a Gionese? marco replied that she was well then the Gionese maid went with them that i know for certain and where have they gone to cordova a city the boy gave vent to a sigh then he said resolutely then i will go to cordova ah poor child exclaimed the gentleman in spanish poor boy cordova is hundreds of miles from here marco turned as white as a corpse and clung with one hand to the railing let us see let us see said the gentleman moved to pity and opening the door come inside a moment let us see if anything can be done he sat down gave the boy a seat and made him tell his story listening to it very attentively meditated a little then said resolutely you have no money have you i still have a little answered marco the gentleman reflected for five minutes more then seated himself at a desk wrote a letter sealed it and handing it to the boy he said to him listen to me little italian take this letter to boca that is a little city which is half Gionis and lies two hours journey from here any one will be able to show you to the road go there and find the gentleman to whom this letter is addressed and whom every one knows carry the letter to him he will send you off to the town of rosario to-morrow and will recommend you to someone there who will think out a way of enabling you to pursue your duty to cordova where you will find the benquinas family and your mother in the meanwhile take this and he placed in his hand a few lire go and keep up your courage you will find fellow countrymen of yours in every direction and you will not be forsaken farewell the boy said thank you without finding any other words went out with his bag and having taken leave of his little guide he set out slowly and sadly in the direction of boca filled with amazement at the great and noisy town everything that had happened to him from that moment until the evening of that day afterwards lingered in his memory in a confused and uncertain form like the wild vagaries of a person in a fever so weary was he so troubled so despondent and at nightfall on the following day after having slept overnight in a poor little chamber in a house in boca beside a harbour porter after having passed nearly the whole of that day seated on a pile of beams and as in delirium in sight of thousands of ships and boats and tugs he found himself on the poop of a large sailing vessel loaded with fruit which was setting out for the town of rosario and was managed by three robust giones who were bronzed by the sun and their voices in the dialect which they spoke put a little comfort into his heart once more the voyage lasted three days and four nights and it was a continual amazement to the little traveller three days and four nights on that wonderful river Parana, in comparison with which our great po is but a riverette and the length of italy quadrupled does not equal that of its course the barge advanced slowly against this immeasurable mass of water it threaded its way among long islands once the haunts of serpents and tigers covered with orange trees and willows like floating coppice now they passed through narrow canals from which it seemed as though they could never issue forth now they sailed out on vast expanses of water having the aspect of great tranquil lakes then among islands again through the intricate channels of an archipelago amid enormous masses of vegetation a profound silence reigned the large stretches the shores and vast solitary waters produced the impression of an unknown stream upon which this poor little sail was the first in all the world to venture itself 
the further they advanced the more this monstrous river dismayed him he imagined that his mother was at its source and that this navigation must last for years twice a day he ate a little bread and salted meat with the boatmen who perceiving that he was sad never addressed a word to him at night he slept on deck and woke fair every little while with a start astounded by the limpid light of the moon which slivered the immense expanse of water and the distant shores and then his heart sank within him cordoba he repeated that name cordoba like the name of one of those mysterious cities of which he had heard in fables but then he thought my mother passed this spot she saw these islands these shores and then these places among which the glance of his mother had fallen no longer seemed strange and solitary to him at night one of the boatmen sang that voice reminded him of his mother's songs when she had lulled him to sleep as a little child on the last night when he heard that song he sobbed the boatman interrupted his song then he cried courage courage my son what the deuce again is crying because he is far from home the geonies go around the world gallantly and triumphantly and at these words he shook himself he heard the voice of geonies blood and he raised his head aloft with pride dashing his fist down on the rudder yes he said to himself and if i am also obliged to travel for years and years to come over the world and to traverse hundreds of miles on foot i will go on until i find my mother were i to arrive in a dying condition and fall dead at her feet if only i can see her once again courage and in this frame of mind he arrived at daybreak on a cool rosy morning in front of the city of rosario situated on the high banks of the panorama where the flags and yards of the hundred vessels of every land were mirrored in the waves shortly after landing he went to the town bag in hand to seek the Argentina gentleman from whom his protector in Boca had entrusted him, with a visiting card, with a few words of recommendation. On entering Rosario, it seemed to him that he was coming into a city with which he was already familiar. There were the straight, endless streets, bordered with low white houses, traversed in all directions above the roofs by great bundles of telegraph and telephone wires which looked like enormous spider-webs and a great confusion of people of horses and of vehicles his head grew confused he almost thought that he had got back to buenos aires and must hunt up his cousin once more he wandered about for nearly an hour making one turn after another and seeming always to come back to the same street and after much inquiring he found the house of his new protector he pulled the bell there came to the door a big light-haired gruff man who had the air of a steward and who demanded awkwardly with a foreign accent what do you want the boy mentioned the name of his patron the master has gone away replied the steward he set out yesterday afternoon for buenos aires with his whole family the boy was speechless a moment and then he stammered but I, I i have no one here i am alone and he offered the card the steward took it read it and said surly i don't know what to do for you i'll give it to him when he returns a month hence but i i am alone i am in need exclaimed the lad in his supplicating voice here eh, come now said the other just as though there were not a plenty of your sort from your country in rosario be off and do your begging in italy and he slammed the door in his face the boy stood there as though he had been turned to stone. Then he picked up his bag again slowly and went out, his heart torn with anguish, his mind in a whirl, assailed all at once by a thousand anxious thoughts. What was to be done? Where was he to go? From Rosario to Cordova was a day's journey by rail. He had only a few lire left. After subtracting what he should be obliged to spend that day, he would have next to nothing left. Where was he to find the money to pay his fare? he could work but how to whom should he apply for work ask alms huh no to be repulsed insulted humiliated as he had been a little while ago no never never more rather would he die and at this idea and at the sight of a very long street which was lost in the distance he felt his courage desert him once more flung his bag on the sidewalk sat down with his back against the wall 
and bent his head between his hands in an attitude of despair. People jostled him with their feet as they passed. The vehicles filled the no road with noise. Several boys stopped to look at him. He remained thus for a while. Then he was startled by a voice saying to him in a mixture of Italian and Lombard dialect, What is the matter, little boy? He raised his face at these words and instantly sprang to his feet, uttering an exclamation of wonder. You hear? It was the own Lombard peasant with whom he had struck up a friendship during the voyage. The amazement of the peasant was no less than his own, but the boy did not leave him time to question him. He rapidly told his story, concluding, Now I am without a soldo. I must go to work. Find me work that I may get together a few lire. I will do anything. I will carry rubbish. I will sweep the streets. I can run on errands or even work in the country. I am content to live on black bread, but only let it be so that I may set out quickly, that I may find my mother once more. To me this charity, and find me work, find me work for the love of God, for I can do no more. The douche, you say, said the pleasant looking about him and scratching his chin. What a story is this? To work, to work, that is soon said. Let us look about a little. Is there no way of finding thirty lire among so many fellow countrymen? The boy looked at him consoled by a ray of hope. Come with me, said the pleasant. Where, asked the lad, gathering up his bag again. Come with me. The peasant started on. Marco followed him. They traversed a long stretch of street together without speaking. The peasant halted at the door of an inn which had for its sign a star, and an inscription beneath, the Star of Italy. He thrust his face in and turned to the boy. He said cheerily, We have arrived just at the right moment. They entered a large room where there were numerous tables, and many men seated, drinking and talking loudly. The old Lombard approached the first table, and from the manner in which he saluted the six guests who were gathered around it, it was evident that he had been in their company until a very short time previously. They were red in the face and were clinking their glasses, and vociferating and laughing. Comrade, said the Lombard, without any preface, remaining on his feet and presenting Marco, here is a poor lad, our fellow countryman, who has come alone from Genoa to Buenos Aires to seek his mother. At Buenos Aires they told him she is not here, she is in Cordova. He came in a bark to Rosario three days and three nights on the way, with a couple of lines of recommendation. He presents the card. They made an ugly face at him. He hasn't a sentimesto to bless him. Self with, he is here alone and in despair. He is a lad full of heart. Let us see a bit. Can't we find enough to pay for his ticket to go to Cordova in search of his mother? Are we to leave him here like a dog? Never in the world, my heavens. That shall never be said, they all shouted at once, hammering on the table with their fist. A fellow countryman of ours? Come hither, little fellow. We are immigrants. See what a handsome young rogue. Out with your coppers, comrades. Bravo. Come along. He has pluck. Drink a sup, compadriot. We'll send you to your mother, never fear. And one pinched his cheek, another slapped him on the shoulder. A third relieved him of his bag. Other immigrants rose from the neighboring tables and gathered about. The boar's story made the round of the inn. Three Argentina guests hurried in from an adjoining room, and in less than ten minutes the Lombard peasant, who was passing around the hat, had collected forty-two lire. Do you see, he said then, turning to the boy, how fast things are done in America? Drink, cried another to him, offering him a glass of wine, to the health of your mother. All raised their glasses, and Marco repeated, to the health of my but a sob of joy choked him, and settling the glass on the table, he flung himself on the old man's neck. At daybreak on the following morning he set out for Cordoba, ardent and happy, filled with thoughts of happiness, but there is no cheerfulness that rules for long in the face of certain sinister aspects of nature. The weather was close and dull, the train, which was nearly empty, ran through an immense plain, destitute of every sign of habitation. He found himself alone in a very long car, which resembled those on trains for the wounded. He gazed to the right, he gazed to the left, and he saw nothing but an endless waste, strewn with tiny deformed trees, with contorted trunks and branches, in altitudes such as were never seen before, almost of wrath and anguish, 
and a sparse and melancholy vegetation which gave to the plain the aspect of a ruined cemetery he dozed for half an hour then resumed his survey the spectacle was still the same the railroad stations were deserted like the dwellings of hermits when the train stopped not a sound was heard it seemed to him that he was alone in a lost train abandoned in the middle of the desert it seemed to him as though each station must be the last and that he should then enter the mysterious regions of the salvages an icy breeze nipped his face on embarking at genoa toward the end of april it had not occurred to him that he should find winter in america and he was dressed for the summer after several hours of this he began to suffer from cold and in connection with the cold from the fatigue of the days he had recently passed through filled as they had been with violent emotions and from sleepless and harassing nights he fell asleep slept a long time and awoke benumbed he felt ill then a vague terror of falling ill of dying on the journey seized upon him a fear of being thrown out there in the middle of that desolate prairie where his body would be torn in pieces by dogs and birds of prey like the corpse of horses and cows which he had caught sight of every now and then beside the track and from which he had turned aside his eyes in disgust in this state of anxious illness in the midst of the dark silence of nature his imagination grew excited and he looked on the dark side of things was he quite sure after all that he should find his mother at cordova and what if she had not gone there what if that gentleman in the via de los autos had made a mistake and what if she were dead thus meditating he fell asleep again and dreamed that he was in cordova and it was night and that he heard cries from all the doors and all the windows she is not here she is not here she is not here this aroused him with a start in terror and he saw at the other end of the car three bearded men enveloped in shawls of various colors who were staring at him and talking together in a low tone and the suspicious flashed across him that they were assassins and that they wanted to kill him for the sake of stealing his bag fear was added to his consciousness of illness and to the cold his fancy already upset became unbalanced and distorted the three men kept on staring at him one of them moved towards him then his reason wandered and rushed towards him with arms wide open he shrieked i have nothing i am a poor boy i have come from italy i am search of my mother i am alone do not do me any harm they instantly understood the situation they took pity on him petted and soothed him speaking to him in many words which he did not hear nor comprehend and seeing that his teeth were chattering with cold they wrapped one of their shawls around him and made him sit down again so that he might go to sleep and he did fall asleep once more as night was falling when they aroused him he was in cordova End of section 19 recording by Kristen Lewis Houston Texas